Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of 10 Forward Weekly. Um, my name is Mike Fadum, also known as Ambassador Kell, and I am your host uh, and your community manager and, you know, a bunch of other things. Uh, and I'm very excited this week because we are joined by uh, an avid STO player and a man who, uh, you know, did some other stuff in that other star thing that we don't talk about. Uh, Sam Whitworth's here, everybody. <laughs> How you doing, Sam? Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. How's it going with you? Should I, should I ask you to answer for what? Oh, go for it. Let's just let's okay. just get started. Sam sure. Sam said he had questions. He had questions I for me. Questions. <laughs> questions. I'm going to use the sort of code name. Uh huh. Uh, so I don't spoil it. Yeah, there's some spoilers right. for the the Klingon content from I think seven years sure. ago <laughs> that we're about to drop. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know. Maybe someone hasn't played. The bottom line is this: I started a Klingon character not too long ago, and I was shocked that uh, a certain Klingon died. Um, died right in front of me on, on the thing. I mean, I and think you could I'm, say who. I'm, I think everybody knows. Kintar. Oh, people are saying we can't hear you. I'm going to turn you up. Uh, keep going, though. Yo, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that still going through? Is it working? All right, let me know if we can hear you now, uh, folks. Testing, uh, testing, testing. Seem uh okay now people are saying loud, loud and, and clear. clear loud and clear loud and <laughs> okay I, I would love it if wraith shadow was like loud and clear just to sabotage us <laughs> like, he's really he's really quiet loud and clear for me man yeah it's, it's like, all working for me <laughs> so, so kim tar man yeah kim tar died yeah and i get it i get it kim tar is sort of he's like fulfilling the prophecy because when he goes back in time he says i was not strong enough i didn't listen to you when i was a kid i didn't train as a warrior and then you died in front of me and i need to stop that from happening so i'm going to go back and make young alexander more interested in his klingon heritage and so this is a this is a, a, a sort of a a wonderful completion of that little prophecy of like it's either going to be him or Worf, but it's it's kimtar and i i'm, I'm not <laughs> using his name because uh, i don't want to spoil it for people who start a klingon character but we love that character with it's like it's a character man what the what and but not only that we saw that character on deep space nine trying just trying to get i know just trying to be noticed i know and what are you it's guys hard doing? when I mean, you like, got that famous of a dad unbelievable yeah. unbelievable i love by the way i love uh i love hearing michael dorn's it's so great voice. right yeah, he's... it's so good. And like all the Klingon actors we got in, um, you know, Michael Dorn, but especially um, like Tony Todd and oh. uh, J.G. Hertzler. And like they yeah. all just when you put them in their Klingon mode, they just freaking yes. go for it, man. And Did it's I tell so you? Great. So so I was um, I was at the grocery store before all this lockdown stuff. And uh, <laughs> and, and and I was walking by and at the at the. Um, the cash machine was Tony Todd. What? <laughs> and I could, I, I stopped and I turned around and I'm like, I'm going to do it. Cause generally when I, when I see a celebrity or someone like that or an actor, yeah, I, I tend to leave them alone. It's sort of the yeah. way we, we sometimes do it. You say, Hey, you nod from across the room. Right. Or, Hey, know. hello. Yeah. Great. I've, I loved I've, you in this. Yeah. I've actually done but that I, to you before. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and by the way, there's, there's, it's, it's, you know, it's, um, there's no hard and fast rule. I have, right. I have a whole story with Don Knotts where I wish I could go back in time. And me and my <laughs> friends who were 21 at the time, when we w we didn't talk to Don Knotts, we were in a restaurant, there's Don Knotts. And we were like, you know, we don't, we, we were new to LA. So we're like, I guess you, we just don't bother them. I think that's yeah. the way we do it here. And now I'm looking back going, he died a few years later and I'm looking back going, no, I think Don Knotts would have gotten a kick out of two young 20, 21 year old kids going, you're awesome. You're the guy. <laughs> You're Don Knotts, you know, because he at that point he hadn't been working in a long time. He's he'd retired. So anyway, Tony Todd and I stop and I turn around. I'm like, and we actually have a few mutual acquaintances. But I'm like, all right, I'm gonna do it. I'm like, listen, sir, I'm sorry to bother you, but I was just watching it on TV not yesterday, and Kern is awesome. I watch you were uh, you were on uh, I was watching Netflix you were on Next Gen yesterday and you're fantastic. And Mr. Cool Tony Todd bro, you know just just opened up a conversation with me. you an actor. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I don't know a few things and stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, we follow each other on Twitter now, but That's awesome. What a cool guy. And the thing is about Tony Todd and Michael Dorn and uh 
J.G. Hertzer, Hertzer, Hertzer and um, yeah. Um, um, and Robert O'Reilly. Yeah, who just joined the our thing game as well. With with those guys. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to you and your yeah. house. Experience um, beach. <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Which I, I played that game back in the day. I played oh, that. I played it at my friend's house uh, New Year's Eve last year. Uh, like yeah. we got we pulled it up on YouTube because he didn't have a VHS player, but we, oh, we played so it. Great. It's it's oh, man, that's an experience in itself. So great. So great. So the thing that I always say, I, well, I don't know. I've, I've been saying this for a while now. Um, I'm more of a fan of the John Ford Klingons from from the book a final reflection way back in the day onward to the fasa role-playing game source books written by john ford i liked his take on the klingons better than i liked the klingons on say next gen yeah except for the fa- or d space nine because they just made more sense to me and then they seem more consistent with what we see in the original series and in fact the original series klingons all the way through general chang and christopher lloyd's krug and so on and so forth yeah, yeah. Um, they all seemed very consistent with that John Ford Soviet era, you know, samurai meets Soviet Russia type, you know, Imperial Japan thing. But really Soviet Russia, because there was a lot of like, well, because that's what the, even... uh, the initial like metaphor was back in the TOS. Right. Days. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I like that better than space Vikings. But the thing is, people like Michael Dorn and Tony Todd and uh, all of the actors that we just mentioned. Yeah. The reason they can make it work is because they are effortlessly what they're trying to convey, right? Mm-hmm. Like a lot of actors as Klingons, I mean, if anyone's ever been in kind of like a, a fight or been in a situation where someone is getting in your face, it's never like the loud people that scare you. It's the quiet people. Mm-hmm. You know, if you ever have a situation where someone's in your face, you know, I'm gonna kick your ass, man. I'm going to kick your ass. And the guy that goes, okay. <laughs> that, that, guy's gonna that guy is going to yeah. win. That guy is going to win. That unnerves yep. the dude who's trying to scare you. You know what I mean? And, well, and that's and, what and I. Not, go ahead. And, and, you know, and Tony Todd, for example, I mean, listen to his voice. This <laughs> yeah. is Captain Crane. You know, and you're just like, it's not just his size, it's, <laughs> it's the effortless presence that he exudes. It's the same thing with Michael Dorn. And Michael Dorn's character is so multi layered that. Yeah. His character utterly works for me. You know, I just I, is it, Worf the longest running character on Trek. Someone in chat is going to correct yes. me on that, but I feel like he he is. I think he has the most episodes out of anybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I've been talking too long. No, 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 you, no, you no, 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 no. That's fine. I, I this is Klingons are my favorite thing. So this is oh. my favorite conversation right now. All I, all I was going to say was, you know, if you listen, uh, you, have you done Reno Sompek? The uh, um, the. Arena? Yeah, I think okay. I know. Wait okay. a second. I don't know if I've gone through all, all of it. Okay, the arena is a, it's one of the events we do, but Tony does the uh um the like, you know, mission giving for stuff like that. And it's just oh, it's I know. like all all of those guys as I'm sure as you know as a voice actor, it's hard when you get into a booth to like show a sense of urgency and like, sure. you know, with all that stuff and all four of those guys just really nail like you feel like you're in the combat with them and like Martok's calling you over comms and screaming at you. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that, for example, the um, yeah the the event recently where you're do- you're shooting down the dilithium ships yeah. and all that stuff. Those three actors, um, in all of the stuff, or you know, when Tony Todd's talking about the Zenkathy of blah, blah blah, I'm like, oh my god, it's just <laughs> it feels it feels effortlessly. I I believe that they're warriors is what yeah. it is. And yeah. I don't always, you know, again, I've, I've said this before. Next Gen was made at a time where TV was a little bit more broad. Now, I, yeah. keep in mind, I watch that show all the time. It's one oh, of my yeah. favorites of all time. And every show that's ever made is a period, is is, a, is, is made of the period. You know, when people talk about William Shatner's um, performance style in the 1960s Star Trek, <laughs> that what, was what largely... What do you mean? What kind well, of performance no, but, but, style but, do you mean? I, you know, <laughs> I want to live! You know, all that stuff <laughs> yeah. and... And, uh, you know, the the bigger moments, but you have to remember, one, people like Shatner and, in fact, all of the cast were theater-trained badasses, yeah. you know? I mean, listen They're hitting to, the back Michelle wall, Nichols. not the person, to the, not the camera. Yeah, well, yeah. that there it is. And, and, and you go, well, wait a second. Why would you be playing to the, to the back, to the, to the uh, you know, to the balcony? Why would you be doing that large theater stuff in front of a camera? And the answer is this. Did you, have you seen a 1960s era color TV? Have you seen what the picture is like? Oh, that's a good point. 
first of all, it's small. The picture, the, the, the tube itself is small. So in order to convey a big moment, you have to push through all of that fuzz. You have to push through all of that, that jargon, the, the electronic fuzz, the, the shoddy color and the size to create these big moments. Now, if you watch Shatner in the movies, he he's comes down a lot. Very small. Yeah. You know, comparatively very small. Why? Because he knows that he's on a giant screen and you're watching every little eye twitch that he does. So he he brings Kirk very, very small. Now, of course, he says, Khan! <laughs> but but I, I maintain that is probably his finest moment in terms of... Because well, when you get a script as an actor, that's like a series of... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... Oh, no, no, I was going to say, like, I think that's it's it's totally earned in that moment. Like, it just... It, you know, they did it again in Into Darkness and it wasn't as, as earned. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, earned, Whereas, yeah. like, his... Like, ev- he's lost everything. Everything's broken down. It's just a scream of frustration well, and he actually owns that but it's even la- but it's layered even beyond that with kirk because what people forget about with kirk screaming con is not only is kirk going through the frustration of having lost midshipman first class peter pressman and a bunch of <laughs> trainees on the enterprise yep. of of the the try you know seeing his son almost being killed by his son losing captain terrell all these awful things that have been happening and he's feeling very responsible and he's feeling off of his game. So it's all that frustration, but it's also captain Kirk doing what he does best, which is being a tricky son of a bitch. And he knows he has to sell it. He's like, Khan will not leave. He will not leave us alone here on, on, in this planetoid. He'll kill us all. He'll do something awful. If I don't convince him that he's one. Cause remember Kirk knows he's like, he's like, you know, Mr. Spock, it's two hours. Are you ready? Right on schedule, Captain. We'll beam you aboard. You know that whole thing. He's like, <laughs> I don't like to lose. Kirk had a plan going in to the, the planetoid. He knew, but the plan only works if Khan doesn't kill them. So he's got to go, <laughs> you've got me. I'm panicked. You've got, I, I'm buried alive. Like you said, you got me. Oh, no. Okay, is he gone? <laughs> Great. Great. Let's get to work. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's So Shatner... All of those different layers to that performance, which again, people forget that that Khan is a trick. He's tricking Khan. And he's got, and he also knows how smart Khan is. So he's got to do it. He's got to be utterly convincing. So, so my thing was with Shatner. I mean, again, dude, if, if people don't believe how brilliant that man is, first of all, look how many times he's reinvented his career, the Denny Crane and all this stuff and Priceline Negotiator and all these things. <laughs> Or or watch a uh, watch a movie that he did before Star Trek called The Intruder, and he is chilling and horrifying, and even more scary than say Ed Norton in um, in American History X. Yeah. I mean, he is a terrifying presence in that movie. Or hell, just um, watch him Shatner, in the Twilight Zone. <laughs> in the Twilight Zone, Nightmare of Twenty Thousand Feet. Um, but he is so accomplished and so great. And if you if you ever wonder what that man's value to Star Trek was, watch The Cage. Because if you watch The Cage, Jeffrey Hunter, who's absolutely fantastic in that role, and he's great as Captain Pike, but when you watch that show, you're like, Star Trek would not have become the legendary thing that it was without the the levity and the buoyancy that Shatner yeah. brought to the show and the humor. Yeah. Wouldn't have existed. We wouldn't have had it. We would not be playing Star Trek Online if it weren't for William Shatner. Anyway, sorry. No, no, no. Let's that's good. I like the rant. Things. I like I like the rants. No, I was just going to say it. That's what um, you know, Anson Mount now, in bringing it full circle, brought to Pike in season two of Discovery. <laughs> that kind of humor, so and good. which, which yeah. brought the whole thing together and got that show kind of rolling again. Uh, which right. And where do you think uh, uh, Anson Mount got that? <laughs> yeah exactly exactly right um yeah. okay so uh you mentioned that you've just started playing a klingon character for the first time how long have you been playing sto you know i, I played it a little bit on and off since it since it came out but oh. i was one of those things where i would always check in play a little bit and then go and do something else or or leave town for <laughs> <three> years <laughs> and then go back and check out what 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 was new there so yeah, yeah, it's hard when you get yanked into Vancouver for uh, for a couple of years for a show. <laughs> well, you know what? You know, it's funny. Most of the jobs that I've done are are uh, you know they're always um, out of town. It's and and sometimes for a long time, you know, Montreal or Vancouver or or wherever. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's you know that's yeah. yes. Uh, so what kind of captain is your main guy? I'm assuming Federation because I can see the Constitution behind you, uh, and because I heard that whole rant about uh, Shatner just now. But yeah. <laughs> what's, yeah, what's, t- tell us about your character, man. Yeah, never, well, you funny. know who wants to do it. Yeah, I, uh, I my buddy started a uh, 
a TOS character. And, and when I started, they, there weren't any such thing as TOS yeah. characters. So my character is like, <laughs> he's like a TOS fanboy. You know, with the, the 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 joke that me and my buddy make is that he's actually from the 23rd century, and my character <laughs> is a huge fan of the 23rd century. But I've been assigned <laughs> nice. to him to be like, I'm here to help you acclimate to the 24th, uh, the no, the 25th century. And he's like, you know, we didn't really talk like that. Back yeah, then. that's and that just, was just Kurt. <laughs> so, oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. What kind of uh, what kind of ship are you rocking right now? Uh, to, uh, we're constitution of course yeah. a constitution class you know i i have the uh what is it is it the um what vanity shield is the one i think it's the you've been on sto for many years vanity shield or whatever it is oh the veteran one or i think it's the veteran one yeah. or whatever it is but what what i liked about it was that when i when i applied it to the constitution ship um it applied the sort of pearlescent paint job from the Star Trek, the motion picture enterprise, Ooh. not the texture because I'm, I'm going full constitution. So the texture is constitution class ship or rather the, the geography, the geometry is this constitution class, but the texture, the paint job is the nice pearlescent thing that they did uh, only in Star Trek, the motion picture. So if that proves what kind of a geek I am, I, I actually <laughs> pay attention to how they painted these models and stuff like that. You would, you would fit in right in here. Our ship team, uh, is just the biggest friggin' starship nerds in the universe. Thomas Maroney sure. is our lead ship artist. Would uh, like when he was building. Um, I think it was the one of the updates to the Ta- Connie he did. He actually went to the Smithsonian to look at the original model and take a whole bunch of pictures and stuff like I that. I saw that, by the way. Have you? Did, 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 was he shocked? For example, that that is a really good master replicas Connie. Yeah. But strictly speaking, that paint job. They studied the model at the Smithsonian before the restoration so that paint job is actually not as accurate as i would like it to be because there's 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 hints of green and blue in the gray green for god's sakes i am i am Um, shocked sir that you haven't just repainted it yourself (laughs) based on everything we've talked about in the last half half, half hour (laughs) i noticed the details i'm not necessarily able to execute the details so but well, yeah, green. I when I saw that thing <clears throat> at the Smithsonian, uh, I was shocked because you can really tell that that's the real deal. You can really tell. Yeah. Uh, someone was asking. Uh, I don't know if you know off the top of your head which version of the Connie you're flying. Is it the the T six one or the? Uh, I know it's not the, the legendary T- one. T six light cruiser. Uh, okay. That one. Okay. Really, I'm. Yeah, yeah. You know, like. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, I've got some other ships that I tool around with and I love the, the, what is it? The Ranger class or the, the, the one thing I want to know is why the T6 is the Ranger. I think it's the Ranger temporal battle cruiser, uh, doesn't allow me to use the, um, the pioneer interior that has the phaser (laughs) shooting range (laughs) and the, uh, because the because the T what is it T four version has yeah. all of those has it has a its own interior, um, but I cannot use it on that. So there, so yeah. you see, I'm I'm taking you down. Sir. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, no, the thing I always have to say on stream because everybody wants more and more bridges. Our our engine has some quirks to it, uh, and one <laughs> of them is that um, it, every ship any bridge we want to put on the ship has to be added individually to each individual ship. And there's some like 600 ships in the game. Uh, oh so things, things slip through the cracks on occasion. Uh, I'll ask it. about the Ranger, but you know, <laughs> yeah, the, the, it's the temporal battle cruiser. The T six version does not allow you to use the, I believe it's called the pioneer interior, which is a TOS interior, but it's not, enter, it's not USS enterprise or constitution. It's, it's its own thing. It's got different rooms that you can that are not on the Constitution class ship. It's got a phaser shooting range and some other cool stuff. It's even got a cool um, film grain. Oh effect. yeah, yeah, I know that from the uh, hey board. Uh, I, I loved how they did that with them when they did the TOS expansion, which was just before I started working here. Um, it was like. You know, they put the film grain on everything. All the enemies look like they're made out of like paper mache and cardboard. Like yeah, it's just yeah. they really captured that aesthetic super well. I love that. I love yeah. that. All right, so chat's asking. Tell tell us about your doggo. Oh, this is Buster. Buster was a pit bull that an owner uh, surrendered because uh, he was not being well cared for or well fed or any of those things. <laughs> so Buster at the time was only about eight months old and. And my thing was, I was just going to, you know, a, a friend of mine, <laughs> a friend of mine said, hey, 
she she put it on Facebook. She's like, can someone foster this pit bull for four or five days or so? Because we're going to get him set up with a pit bull rescue. We just don't want this guy to go to a regular animal shelter and then get euthanized. So, yeah. You know, pit bulls are not always seen as the most friendly dogs. So I, uh, I loaded my dog, Leonard, who's half American bulldog, mutt guy, you know, love of my life. I loaded him <laughs> in a car with, with my friend Ainsley. And we jumped in her way. We jumped into her car uh, because I said, listen, I'll be your backup. I've got, you know, I think but Leonard might have fun with a dog for a few days. I'll be your backup. Yeah. And then the moment, you know, I said, I'll be your backup. A friend of mine said, oh, you just got another dog. I'm like, no, I didn't. <laughs> not, no, one dog is quite enough. So anyway, we went and got Buster. We uh, we put this put a leash on him and he started flipping out like he just didn't even know what a leash was so i'm like oh this is gonna be fun this guy is just like he's just flailing and thrashing all over the place it's gonna be this for four or five days but you know what this is for a good cause i'm gonna do this and then the moment he walked through the threshold of my house and he'd met leonard in the car and stuff like that they seem to be getting along the moment he walked into the threshold of my house it's almost like, because he'd never been inside anywhere before. He was never allowed inside. Oh, and wow. it's almost like he knew this was his shot. <laughs> Buster, Buster is a good dog, but he has never been more obedient than he was that first week. <laughs> <laughs> Buster, sit. You need to sit there. Buster, come here. You need to come over here. <laughs> Buster, you know, dude, and it, it was just like he was just, I mean, just sir. Just, and, 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 and I have pictures of him. Um, you know, some dogs, if they like each other, might nuzzle each other or want to play and paw. I have pictures of Buster on top of Leonard hugging him with his arms like this, you know, and uh, just he was so in love with Leonard. He was so in love with me. He was so in love with the house and he was being such a good dog. And I remember about I remember I was like trying to work this out. My friend Ains, I'm sorry, I'm telling you the long story. No, no, sure. that's good. Done. That's it's good. Almost done. You got to stop so, apologizing for the long stories, man. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. No, don't apologize for apologizing. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, for sorry, for sorry. So eventually, what happened was, uh, one day I woke up and and I was like, you know, Buster is a really, really great dog. He's a fantastic dog. I just, you know what? I don't know if I can handle two dogs right now. This is, you know, because I have a whole routine with Leonard, and this is getting disrupted and. Buster, you know, doesn't know how to walk on a leash. And anyway, that's, yeah, I'm going to just help him get adopted. And I've made a decision. I'm not going to keep him. And I was waking up in the morning with that decision. And then I look over at Buster and then Buster gets off the bed, goes to the ground, an area with wood floor and pukes on the ground. <laughs> and, vomited. and I was like, no, no, no. And I'm, and I grab his towels and I'm cleaning up his vomit. And he's looking like this, like, you know, looking at me like this. And I'm like, he's mine. I'm keeping him. Yep. I'm keeping him because I'm cleaning <laughs> up his vomit. <laughs> like, he's my dog. Oh, he's my dog. That's and then Ainsley laughed her ass off because she's like, yeah, I, I was I was hoping that if Buster stayed with you for a few days, it was done. And I'm like, yeah. it worked. He, he was going to win me over no matter what. But the way he won me over was vomiting. So. Yeah, Good that's job, that's man. how that works. They they yeah. worm their way into your hearts via the destruction of your property. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's, yeah. And and Buster, by the way, has you know he, again he he learned very quickly, and and I was he learned how to be on a leash, and him and Leonard. I even brought I even brought my uh, a friend of mine who's a really great dog trainer. He brought him over, and he's like, listen, man, Leonard is um you know he's like the old Harrison Ford of dogs. You know? <laughs> Leonard is kind of like this. That's all true. What's this happy or shit? You know, he's like that. He's like, but Leonard with his, all of his moodiness, if there's a good match for him, it's probably this dog right here. And so I'm like, all right, well, that's that. There, clenches there you it. go then. It. Whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, all right. Uh, so I was going to so somebody in chat was uh, taking you, having you on the stream as an announcement that we're going to have you join the voice cast of the game. I'm just going to say, cause I don't have the power to make that happen. And I've gotten in trouble <laughs> for trying to do that before, but I definitely uh, might, you know, poke out a little bit here and there. What, what kind of character, somebody asked earlier, what kind of character would you want to voice in STO if you were going to voice one? Jeez. Jeez. I mean, it'd be interesting to try a Klingon because I would be all John Ford about it. You know? <laughs> um, because again, you know, when you, you look at those those original performances, they're, they're very, they're quite varied. You know, you have Captain Koloth, who's kind of snarky and, uh, my dear Captain Kirk, you know, and then you have Kur, 
military governor of Arcadia. You know, and then you have <laughs> you have Kang. You will die in the icy cold of space. It would be really fun to do a an old TOS style Klingon. God, the, when the, that episode when the three of them came back was so freaking cool. I know. I sorry, tangent, wild tangent. Uh, all right, so give me. Um, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I'm a monster. Uh, uh, give me uh, uh, It Is a Good Day to Die in a, a cl- like what kind of old school Klingon you would, how, how you would do it. Oh, wow. Because you have Worf, you know. Right. It is a good day to die. You know, you have that. <laughs> um, it is a good day to die. I don't know, something like that. Oh, that's cool, dude. Darth, it is a good day to die. and Because my Klingon would be a little bit more quiet. Yeah. You'd be more threatening by being quiet. I mean, hey, look, think about this. Think about the fact that General Chang reads Earth literature. What does that tell you about that era of Klingon? Well, it tells you that hang these on, guys that's Klingon are... literature, sir. <laughs> the original Klingon, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Captain Kirk. Um, but, but General Chang studies his enemy. Yeah. And that's very John Ford. The idea, you know, John Ford's idea about the Klingon, the human looking Klingons was that the Klingons were their version of diversity was a subjugating worlds and every now and then bringing another alien race character on board a ship if they were really good at something, but they were never an equal to the Klingons. Right. But the idea is that they use their genetic, they, they genetically created Klingons that looked like humans to be used on the human border. Yeah. And then they looked, they made Klingons that looked like Romulans to be used on the Romulan border. And they were still physiologically Klingons. But the idea was these one, these guys can operate on planets that humans are comfortable with. They will be much better to deal with the humans. And you know, this'll, and and what a strange, again, very, you know, authoritarian, you know, scary government thing that they were doing. And when you consider the fact that those Klingons carried agonizers around with them and stuff like that, when you consider the fact that core talks about how they're all under surveillance, they have surveillance cameras everywhere. The Klingons were, there was some really scary stuff that hasn't been explored since the original series about the Klingons, you know? Yeah. It would be, that would be interesting to do, you know, especially since we're now bouncing around in the timeline so much with all of our shows. Uh, you know, right. it'd be an interesting one to, I would love to do a Klingon focused show. You know, I'd well, love to and see you know, that. My, my thing is this, there's room enough for everything. If you watch cultures over the years, cultures change. Yeah. There can, they can be space Vikings in the 24th century and be kind of very different people in yeah. the 23rd century or the 22nd century. Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, well, and we've got, you know, with the um, the new storyline we just started doing, you know, with Reika Sharma's character, who's the, the, the witch of Nimbus 3 and the very, like, Klingon intelligence and, uh, you know, uh, much more smoke and mirrors than straight up, you know, sword fights and stabbing people. I think there's a lot of room for expanding totally. that part of the Klingon lore, too. Yeah, the idea of, of Klingon intelligence, I mean, you're right, you have to remember that Arn Darvin, there's nothing about that guy that says Klingon. So that yeah. says their intelligence yeah. service is actually quite good. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like they're actually, as much as they say, we don't do that. And be like, yeah. And that's how we get away with it. We always say we don't do that. But <laughs> you're really good at, you know, there was uh, something. In well, it's the, like uh, section 31. In, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't do that. Except we're over here doing that. Right. <laughs> Ex- except, except in, right. Except in Discovery, they're, they apparently have a base. <laughs> Well, you know, it's early Section 31. They hadn't worked out all the kinks yet. <laughs> True. You can say that, that they were a thing, they went away, but they had never really went away. Hold on for a second. Let me yeah. see what's up with Leonard. Okay, sounds good. What's going on? All right, I will stand do by, some... Yeah, yeah, standing by. I will do some uh, some Q&A in chat while we're waiting for Sam and Leonard. <laughs> Lots of people saying Section 31 isn't covert. That's true. Uh, yeah, I guess I could do the fan art while we're... Um... Or waiting on Sam. Hold on. Let's see. All right, let's bring it up. All right, so this I've got a list of who did the fan art too. So this is Sequest thirty sixty two sent us this excellent shot of I believe that's the Donnie, the Disco Connie flying out through space. Looks really really good. <laughs> Someone says, "Quick, let's dig through his stuff while he's gone." <laughs> Dude, I'm so sorry. So so Leonard is healing from an injury. Yeah, guy is on steroids, and they said. They said, look, some of the side effects are increased um, increased appetite and also maybe possible behavioral changes. So the way that plays out with Leonard is 
he's constantly growling and barking at me for food. He never does that. But now, now that he's roided up and juicing, he's like, dude, where's my food? <laughs> I want... And I'm like, yeah, but you just ate. I want more food. There is so. uh, there is slightly less food in the bowl than there was before. Yeah. Fill it immediately. <laughs> really funny. <laughs> um, but, you know, there, okay, so the, the Modiphius uh, Klingon book, um, again, very space Vikings, but there were some touches in there that I loved, including, um, what do they call them? The Unseen or something like that. They talk oh, yeah. about Klingon intelligence and that no one knows about these guys and these girls. And it's just like, that's, I love that because- yeah. Again, I I want a little bit of diversity with my Klingons. Yeah. I want a world where Krug, Kang, Chang, Worf, Martok all kind of are in the same, you yeah. know? Well, that's something always been the interesting thing to me because, you know, like, um, uh, I'm a big fan of everything Star, dot, dot, dot. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the reason that star trek gets a little deeper sometimes because they have more time you know when you're doing a tv right. show you have a ton more time i mean star wars yeah. is doing that a bit more now with especially with the shows that you were on um but the uh you know when if you're building a clay on culture and you've got you know what 50 more than 50 years of tv shows around those aliens you're going to meet every different kind of person so it's not going to be just klingons are one thing mm -hmm. uh you you meet a whole variety of them that's actually why i love i don't know if you've watched blood of the void uh yet but it's the uh the streaming show that uh stream punks are doing with uh, uh with a modifius um and I... uh there's yeah, I, I haven't seen the show, but I, I saw the sort of intro where they were talking about their characters. And I loved I was intrigued by one of the characters was like five foot two and a, yeah. a small Klingon uh, who everyone underestimated. And, you know, all this different you know, half Vulcan, half Klingon. Yeah. I'm like, that's fascinating. That's cool. Yeah. I love the idea because everyone always asks, OK, if Klingons are just like mindless warriors, how did they build starships that go to space? And right. it's like, well. The what is a Klingon scientist like? I would love to see right. somebody dive into that in more detail. Like how yeah. is how do you get honor out of you know understanding the stars and stuff like that? It's, right. It... I mean, you 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 figure, you know, the way that I always did it in my head canon is I'm like, you know, they became more space Viking like, coming from a dark time after Praxis exploded. Yeah. You know what I mean? When that happened it was almost like, oh, what's the, what's the problem? What's the use? And that they're, they're sort of the warrior at the ethos took a turn and you go from a bunch of alcoholics possibly <laughs> to a bunch of wild space Viking type dudes. That's how that, you know what I mean? Who yeah. actually do, uh, well, it sounds like it's like a um, like almost a conservative movement because the Klingons and Discovery are very close to that, and then as yeah, they, they get are. through TOS, yeah. you get the uh, you know the more I guess modern sort of like you were saying like uh, Soviet Russia kind of Klingons. Right. And so if Praxis is, blows up and your your planet is almost destroyed, I yeah. wonder if that was you know this is just me spitballing, but like a like some sort of sweep of you know we need to return to the old ways sure. came about and brought about all of that stuff. Yeah, no, you're yeah, totally good point. Like, yeah, we have to get back to the way that we were and because we're going to lose our culture to the people that are helping us, the yeah. Federation, you know, the whole Takuvma thing. But it's interesting that the, um, I don't know, like the whole, like Krug, for example, I thought Christopher Lloyd's Klingon was fantastic, um, especially when it comes to, to how he executes David Marcus. Because what I thought was so interesting about that was, you know, if you watch that movie, especially when you're young, it's, it's a horribly villainous move that he executes as Kirk's son. Yeah. It's horrifying. It's bad. Krug's a bad guy. We have to deal with it. But what was really, if you really break down what Nimoy achieved in that moment as a director and, and the whole crew and everyone, it's a much more complicated situation. Because seen from the Klingon perspective, here's what happened. First of all, the Federation has developed a, a small torpedo-like device that you can fire on a planet, and it will vaporize everything on the planet and turn it into something that you can use. Yeah. That's a little horrifying, right? So this guy, Lord Krug, uh, takes, a, um, he takes a Klingon bird of prey with a cloaking device, which at that time was new to the Klingons. Yeah. We didn't have this whole... Cloaking devices, you know, the, the Sulaban had them. This is before all that. This is when this is when Kirk and Spock were shocked that the Romulans had cloaking right. ability. Right. And then the Kling and then the Romulans started using Klingon ships and the Klingons in exchange got Romulan cloaking devices. So Krug has a 
Bird of Prey, which at that time, if you look at fastest Star Trek, was a Romulan design. In yeah. fact, it was designed to be a Romulan ship. It was going to be a Romulan the, ship, which is why it's green. Right. It's got the birds and everything on and it. And the yeah. feathers and all that. And it is, by so, the way, the prettiest ship in Star Trek. I will oh, die on my hell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love it. So he gets a Bird of Prey. He knows the Federation has developed this incredible weapon. He's got to find out about it. He, <laughs> he is forced because of the extreme secrecy because of because also the klingon government it there's it's very much implied that he's on his own and the klingons will disavow him if he's found in federation space it's totally implied i mean the fact that he kills his consort valkris um says that he's under extraordinary pressure and secrecy so here's a guy who had to execute his own wife because she broke this sort of cone of silence yeah you know mistakenly and she understood the, the rules she's like okay yes i guess you have to take me out because i'm a, i'm a risk i'm a liability now finds kirk kirk shows up he's got three hostages in the planet genesis right they won't tell him anything yet then a constitution class starship enters orbit which in his words outgun him 10 to 1 the yeah. bird of prey ship cannot take a constitution class ship except for the fact that the constitution class ship doesn't have a crew <laughs> it's running on an automation system that is not ready for combat. It was a patch job after the damage of the battle with Khan. And if they had a crew, they'd be in good shape, but they don't have a crew. They have like just a few guys on the ship and that's it. Krug doesn't know that. So Krug is looking at a completely losing proposition. The only, the only card that he holds is that he has three hostages on the Genesis planet. So he goes, I will allow you to speak to them. A move of decency yeah. from a Klingon perspective. I'm going to let you talk to the hostages, you know, knowing that if we start shooting at each other, I'm dead. I'm dead in the water. So then he talks to uh, Kirk, talks to David, you know, and he's like, you know, and David says at one point, you know, it, or Kirk says, David, what went wrong with Genesis? Yeah. And David says, I went wrong. And Kirk goes, I, I don't understand. And David, in this moment of embarrassment, because he messed up the Genesis thing and it was his fault, in this moment of this whole political situation with the Klingons, David's feeling the weight of that, right? So David goes, I, I, I'm sorry, sir, just don't surrender. Genesis doesn't work. I can't <laughs> believe they'd kill us for it. Well, the moment David says that, Krug has no choice. Oh, yeah, because he's, like, he's, he's, he's backed up against a wall. He's backed up against yeah. the wall. He's in a fight that he can't win. And one of his hostages said, they're not going to kill us. And he goes, well, now I have to kill one of you. Yeah. I have no choice. And he goes, you know, your, your young friend was mistaken. I meant what I said. And now to prove that my intentions are sincere, I will kill one of the prisoners. And if you see the, the whole, the, the, the Klingon mindset is seen perfectly on the face of his first officer who's standing next to him when he says this. If you watch the actor playing the first officer, yeah. um, it's an amazing, wonderful moment for that actor because when Krug says, we will kill one of the prisoners, if you if you watch the first officer, he's not leering or going, yeah, kapla, yeah, honor, you know, you're dead. No, he's emotionless, poker-faced, looking right at the screen. This is just what we do. Yeah, yeah, I understand. The moment that the, the hostage said that they wouldn't, that we wouldn't kill him, we're going to have to kill him. Yeah. It's nothing personal. We're not trying to be mean. But, but we do have, we to, have maintain, to maintain, yeah, yeah. We have to maintain our, our, uh, you know, our menace here. We have to maintain our hand. So I don't know that type of Klingon. Um, it wasn't John Larroquette. It was he was Maltz. Uh, this was Torg. Hold on, let me get the actor's okay. name because he I, he did a wonderful job in that. Uh, Torg uh, search. I just IMDb this guy the other night. I just thought he did a <laughs> lovely job. Um, I take it you were watching Search for Spock the other night then? I, I wasn't. I just became curious. I get curious about actors. I go, hey, what have yeah. they done? And what are they? what's their deal? And Torg <laughs> was played by Stephen Liska. Okay. And, yeah. anyway. I have eaten some of the food, Father. Bring me more. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You've done well. Kappa! <laughs> right? That type of thing, that, that the the complexity of that moment and the Klingon mindset and the paranoia that the Klingons seem to experience throughout that whole movie points to the things like Klingon surveillance, surveilling their own people, Klingons carrying agonizers, which then grew into the pain sticks and all that stuff. Yeah. So that type of stuff is the stuff I'm the most interested in with the Klingons, you know, or, or assassination of your captain. If 
if the captain does something wrong. It's, it's yeah. crazy stuff. Yeah, that stuff's always been super fascinating, especially the the way you advance in rank in uh, uh, in Klingon like military. Like that's actually my favorite, one of my favorite parts of the tutorial. And they did the new, redid the new the cutscene for it recently. So it's like, oh, this captain's a son of a bitch. Well, I'm just gonna stab him then, and now yeah. I'm the captain. <laughs> like right. on Starfleet, right. the Starfleet side, we have to do this whole backflip of like, yes, you're an ensign, but we're giving you a ship because we need more captains right now. <laughs> Whereas like on the Klingon side, it's like, no, you stab that dude. You're the stab captain the now. <laughs> well, but it wasn't just you stab the dude. It was the first officer tried to kill him, and he killed yeah. that person. So That's now true. you're up. Yep, you're it's, up, up, it's up to you, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> First day on a ship, better stab the captain. <laughs> That's crazy. I have been That's dying to. I've got um, uh, a background in stage combat, and we uh, we just uh, before the pandemic hit, and we all started working from home. We just got a uh, uh, motion capture suit. Um, so oh, the wow. uh, uh, the the scene of Jaula entering the great hall and the new stuff is uh, motion capture. That's our um, uh, our lead environment artist Scott playing Jaula, um, and I'm <laughs> I'm dying to choreograph a bot left fight for something in this year of Klingon. It's so much fun. It's yeah. like, it's such a, it's such a silly weapon. Like it, there's no way it's practical in any way, shape or form, but like, it, that's okay. We're doing stage fights anyway. Let's go impractical with it and see what we can question do. Question for you. Yeah. Question for you. I swear I saw something on YouTube where some martial artist took a bat left and was like, it's actually a better weapon than you think. I saw that too. Um, yeah. And it's like, Is that a lie? well, it's not totally a lie. It's not not a lie. He does a lot of like cool martial arts spinny things with it. It's just, it's a weapon where like, if you're holding it with two hands, you have no reach. And if you're holding it with one hand, it has like, it's just unbalanced. And so it's just, mm. it's just an awkward weapon to use. It's not right. like something that a culture would develop. Like there's a reason that pretty much every culture on earth developed the sword in some way or form. Sure. Uh, Cause it's just, you know, straight metal pointy thing uh, yeah. seems to be pretty effective. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, but Hey, that's what, you know, choreographing for stage combat is for you take the ridiculous stuff and you you know somebody make says okay we're gonna do a flail versus a bow staff it's like all right i'll make that happen give me a few minutes <laughs> sure yeah we're gonna do yeah we're gonna do a uh, double bladed lightsaber against a uh, uh, lady with two lightsabers yeah yeah, right. yeah exactly I, I when when did that happen was that something recently <laughs> <laughs> yes, possibly. I gotta say, uh, diving off into the um, into that other star for half a second before we bro come back to Trek. Um, my wife and I have been watching Jedi Temple Challenge, and I don't oh, cool. think anyone in the history of the planet is having more fun than you are being the dark side. <laughs> that is, were you actually like in in the next room watching the kids do it, or is it all afterwards? Oh, I, that was afterwards. So, yeah. so when one of the kids says, "Yeah, the dark side was annoying," he, they weren't listening to me. They were listening to a friend of mine who was doing a. Uh, he was doing uh, his best Skeletor, actually. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. I'll touch that now. <laughs> you know? oh. Which is funny because <laughs> there was there was a project where they needed a Skeletor-like voice, but they needed it to be new. And so the voice I used for Jedi Temple Challenge was something I developed for something that I didn't get the part on. <laughs> perfect. You know, when you, when you look at it that way with auditions, you're like, yeah. yeah, do the work on the audition because if you don't get it for this job, you'll use it for the next job. Yeah. And and the whole idea was if you, you know, I said to them, I'm like, listen, if we go British for this or we, tr we try to do the traditional dark side holding status thing and he loses often, then he has no status. It's a big joke. You know, if he was just like, Yes, touch that thing, or, you know, yeah. touch the button, use <laughs> your power. But then if he's like, oh, no, then, then he loses status. Yeah. So we had to create, a, I thought, a dark side voice who doesn't care if he loses status. Sort of like the... Um, like a worm tongue kind of deal or something like that. Sort of, yeah. Like he's so sloppy. He's like, I don't care about it. I do it. I don't care. You know, just, he's just <laughs> doesn't care. Doesn't care. Oh, man. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a fun show. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, so, um, let's see. How how much of Hey, by the way, yeah. were you talking about Klingons? Yeah. Chris Lotta. Chris Lotta. Yeah, Chris okay. Lotta. I don't know if do I do. Do you know who he is? I don't think I do, and I'm sometimes a bad Trekkie. I'm going to Google Chris this. Chris Lotta. Let me see, make sure that I have his name right. I think I'm saying it right. Someone in um, chat is going to start screaming at me right now, I'm sure. Oh, dude. No, you need to know about this guy. He's, he's no longer with us, but... As I said, I am all about, um, I'm all about uh, picking out these actors, you know. Oh, uh, Cobra Commander, of course. 
Yeah. Yeah. Chris Lotta was Captain Cargon when Riker goes aboard the Klingon ship to serve in, the, in season two. <sighs> oh, shit. This ship is filled with our finest weapons and you will serve. That guy. And the pack lead captain in the next episode or the previous, <laughs> I think it's the very next episode. You know, we find things that make us go was Starscream. That's crazy, man. So in Star Trek, he talks like this. And then when he gets Megatron around him, he talks like this. Megatron! <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude. <laughs> and you can I hear it. Him. You can hear it very briefly when, when Riker, he goes, you will tell us the surest way to attack the Enterprise. He goes, no, I'm not going to. And he's like, you know, you made an oath. And he's like, yes. And I made an oath to Starfleet. And he goes, they are in conflict. <laughs> and, he, and he almost goes to his uh, Star Screen place. <laughs> they are in conflict. It's got to be so and, crazy because you're talking about doing the work for the audition for, you know, the dark side thing earlier and like, you know, him switching back and the voices like that. You know, how do you hold a different voice? You know, you've got to know like how your throat and your mouth and all. Is that all instinct yeah. stuff or are you like I'm thinking about how to exactly to place the, my inner jaw and stuff? It's all about that. Yeah, it's it's I, I'm I'm a theater trained guy. So we, you know, for for two years every day I was using a really a voice that wasn't wasn't my own they were retraining us on how to think or how to walk talk how to all those things so so if it, if it weren't for that classical theater training i don't think i would know how to approach doing these different voices if that makes sense yeah 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 totally so yeah, yeah stage voice is a real thing you get you get Indeed. you get that when you get up there <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I gotta say though the classical training thing is something that i absolutely miss when it comes to how it appeared in regular television and radio back in the day. Because if you yeah. watch the original Star Trek, everyone is just speaking so beautifully, you know, yeah. like Leonard Nimoy doesn't say command. He says command, you yeah. know, um, you know, uh, Uhura doesn't say, you know, they're signaling captain. They're signaling again. She didn't yeah. say it that way. Guys. She goes, captain, the signaling again, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a, it, in, and because they had those incredible, theater trained voices and, and elocution uh it made it feel like you were in a different year that this was in the future that people were, you know that there was a heightened level to the way that they yeah. talked which is why also i like the fact that you know as much as i love star trek picard i absolutely love it i think they're dead wrong with the swearing i think you can get away with it with tilly but they're dead wrong with the swearing because they made it canon that humans are kind of above that you know, yeah. uh, in Star Trek Four, you know, your use of language is altered since our arrival. You know, they're currently laced with, shall I say, more colorful metaphors. <laughs> Double dumbass on you and so forth. Yeah. Oh, the profanity. That's simply the way they talk here. You know, yeah, yeah. like, and, which is hilarious for Kirk to explain to Spock and then to be swearing wrong all movie. And then Spock takes it over, you know. Yeah. Spock, where the hell's the power you promised me? One damn minute, Admiral. I mean, like, <laughs> if that's not making it canon that, you know, yes, I understand that they didn't swear and stuff in Star Trek because of censorship. But I right. do believe that Roddenberry would have made the point anyway. I think, I think he leaned into it. He goes, no, yeah. they, these people are above that. They do not express frustration the same way, quite the same way that we do. Right. You know, well, and also just language changes over, you know, hundreds mm -hmm. and hundreds of years. Um, right. Yeah. It's, right. I think it's just, you know, cause you see that too in everything Man. nowadays where we, people, at some point in the last, I don't know, couple of decades, we got really obsessed with realism in t TV, especially. And That's so, right. like, even That's in right. stuff like Game of Thrones, like, you know, people are talking, you know, sort of modern and, like, with kind of That's a right. modern British accent as opposed to... <laughs> I went back and tried to watch Excalibur the other day, uh, which is just the, the prime friggin' example of, like, Merlin, we must go forth and... Yeah. <laughs> Come on, yeah! yeah totally. <laughs> um... So yeah, I don't know. It's it's uh, it's interesting. I uh, I was actually thinking yeah. about this is totally going off topic, but I was thinking yeah, about Jupiter Ascending the other day, and I think that might have been what ran that film right. Jupiter into Ascending. You were yeah. th you were thinking about that. I was thinking you? about it. Well, because <laughs> so I have a whole bunch of friends who love that movie and love Speed Racer, and they have all this joy in their lives from the, that these two movies bring them. And I'm sitting here like, I can see that. I, I hate see these movies, and I don't want to hate it. I don't. I want to be part of the fun. I'm the guy who loved John Carter and Tron Legacy. Like, I want to be. I want to be part of the fun. But those ones I can't get into. But I was just thinking about it now. I wonder if that's like, 
you know, because the movie was so like all the alien characters were so out there, but then they talked like normal people. I wonder if that was part of it. You know, for me, that always bugs me when you see an alien and they're like, hey, how's it going? I'm, I'm from, you know, Redondo Beach. And you're like, <laughs> what? I don't get it. I don't yeah. like that. I don't like that. It's like, put the effort in. If the makeup department is putting the effort in, why don't you put the effort in as an actor and create something? You know, I mean, uh, geez, even John Colicos's core, you know, was not talking like John Colicos. John Colicos, you know, I am core. You know, he even almost, almost rolls the R. Yeah. I am core. Military governor of Arcania, you know, and <laughs> he's, he's doing a thing there. And, yeah. uh, I, you know, but you have to have tools to be able to do that. You know, it's the same thing with, with Star Wars to a certain extent. Like with Star Wars, yeah. the thing that I discovered in working on a, a video game years ago called Force Unleashed is that, and this was in watching Mark Hamill's performance, the closer a character gets to the Force, the more that their speech patterns need to be neutralized in terms of any sort of habitual modern pattern because the closer you get to the force the force is a timeless thematic thing in star wars so the closer you get to it the more you need to neutralize things like ours you know when mark hamill in episode four the force for our, our force our yeah. force when he gets older and becomes a jedi it's the force the force it's not force it's yeah. the force and I did the same thing in uh, Force Unleashed that when Starkiller is being all Sith talking to Darth Vader, it's, what is thy bidding, my master? And then when he's talking to Juno, it's like in, in proxy, he's like, all right, guys, what's going on? Okay, we got to do this, we got to do that. <laughs> oh, yes, Lord Vader, what is thy bidding, my master? <laughs> you might say master to yeah. proxy, but he's never going to say that to Vader, you know? So you can, you can do a lot of, of character building if you have awareness of how your voice works, how you make words, how you how you express these things and what your habitual speech is versus what the character is trying to convey. If you, if you always make it part of the character trying to communicate something, it tends to work. Yeah. Um, but, but there are people that, again, like I said, like, you know, they're just kind of their, their actor training does not include any of this. So they're just not aware of, of how to do anything with their voice, nor are they aware that their voice may, may be, a little bit inappropriate for something. Yeah. You know, that type of thing. Uh, funny side story about Force Unleashed, but um, and you will, I do not expect you to remember this. No one would remember this, but uh, that was actually the first time we met. I was filming the launch at Best Buy that you guys did in San Francisco. Dude. Uh, and Dude. I, uh, I got to interview you, and I interviewed you for a couple of minutes, and, uh, you know, I was behind a camera. You never would have seen me. Um, <laughs> and then uh, uh, Lucas showed up, um, and yes, uh, I got yeah. kicked out for, for putting the camera in his face. <laughs> I was uh, I was like about to ask him a question, and the Lucasfilm rep was like, "You have to go right now." Uh, get that <laughs> camera out of my face! Get him out of here. Uh, yeah, uh, that was a, that was fun. The fact that Lucas showed up there was yeah. was such a treat. Oh God! Speaking of that was the that was my uh, speaking of the uh, I wish I'd gone up and talked to somebody you were talking about earlier. Um, I would when I was a kid, I was in Disney World. Uh, and I was eating at one of the fancy restaurants they have at Disney World in a friggin' Star Wars Episode One T-shirt. So it's like 1999. I've got a big tro- droid control ship on my shirt and like Star Wars in big letters. And I look across the restaurant, and Lucas is just sitting there with his family on the <laughs> side of the restaurant. And like the waiter was like, "Do you know who that is? You should go talk to him." And my family was like, "Go talk to him." I'm like, "I'm not gonna be that friggin' kid who goes up to him in like a Star Wars T-shirt. It's like, Mr. Lucas, I love you." <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you oh, want to man. let him know that you like his stuff, he's probably glanced over and goes, oh, that guy's okay. Yeah, like exactly. <laughs> cool. Lucas, uh, it's interesting that he is admitted to having watched and absorbed Star Trek. Yeah. I think yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's where it all, I mean, it's not where it all came from, like, all the way back. Like, all the way back, you're talking Mary Shelley and, like, H.G. Wells and stuff. Sure, but, like, yeah. in terms of where modern sci-fi gets a lot of its aesthetics, that's Trek, man. Well, like, you, you you know where you... I think when it comes to the Star Trek lineage, there's there's one step just before Star Trek that I think it bears mentioning, Forbidden Planet. In fact, I believe that a lot of the people that worked on Forbidden Planet. Am, am I right about that? I know a lot of people that worked on Outer Limits worked on Star Trek, but yeah. I think some of those backdrops that were used in Forbidden Planet were used on the cage. And um, and then and then when it comes to Star Trek, 
you know, I mean, I think one of the biggest leaps forward for science fiction or for science fantasy had to be the work of Matt Jeffries. I mean, the fact is, is that before Star Trek, all you had were flying saucers yep. and rocket ships. Yeah. So what the hell is that? I know. It's What it's is that? Beautiful is what it is, but. It's incredible. You know, I mean, without that, there's no Millennium Falcon. There's no Star Destroyer. There's no one, nothing, you know? <laughs> and, and, and then Matt Jeffries creates the, uh, the Klingon battle cruiser, which yeah. is just like, what is that? I mean, it's just so freaking cool. And I love too going through like working on this job. I've learned so many behind the scenes stories on, you know, all of these like details we've been talking about for the last hour and 15 or whatever, like it comes from, you know, at the time, uh, okay, we need a new ship. We've got to slap some highlighters on this, you know, like then paint over them. And then now we've got a new class and then it comes up to people, you know, decades later to go oh that's those highlighters are the sensor pods they use those to detect chroniton particles those were highlighters uh on, on the uh... on the uh god i think it's on the no i know what you're talking the the frigate it's the yeah. yeah 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 um it's the same ship that apparently picard's friend who died in at the end of season one um that yes. they met on ditalis b uh, ditalics b uh, it's New Orleans. People are Walter are Keogh, New Orleans class. New Orleans class. Right. Yep. Walter Keogh flew a New Orleans class, and that's right. Yeah. yeah. Walker Keel, not Keogh. Keel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know, I I love yeah people. Now that we have all you know, we these th- the details were always there. Well, you know what? No, no, no. That's not true. That's not true. The details were not always there because Star Trek was edited and. Uh, and and finished on video so yeah. while the details were shot we had never seen them the best yeah. product you know the best version of star trek we'd ever seen of the next generation was what we had on dvd a few years back and then when they released the blu-rays i mean it's just like oh un- my god unbelievable I, dude i know it's so great god. did you ever go um to the star trek experience when that was still around Oh yes. yes oh god. So just walking through, I did the backstage tour and just walking through the, because the, they recreated the um, Enterprise D hallway one for one, and mm-hmm. like the um, like including all the little in jokes the crew had put like on the like tr- uh, tubes and stuff hmm. on the wall. So like things that like were completely invisible on you know uh, '90s television sets, and you look at them up close and it's like says the Force will be with you always on like the Enterprise and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> Uh, the the GNDN panels. Do they have any yeah, of those? Goes nowhere, so. does nothing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cetacean ops. We've so, been we've been trying to figure out a way to work cetacean ops. Cetacean into a ships. Ship. I know. I know. <laughs> they they mentioned that in lower decks, didn't yeah. they? Cetacean ops. You know what's what's uh what was fun was when I was a young actor, again about twenty two years old. Um, some Buckaroo Banzai fans of uh, a, a friend of mine guy named Jason Vanover, his dad, Jim Vanover, worked on Star Trek. At that time, they were making Enterprise. And so I would just go in and visit the art department and there would be, you know, that's so cool. Mike and Denise Okuda oh, that's so and cool. Doug Drexler. And I got to know all those guys. And what I would do to entertain them is I would scat original series Star Trek music for them. <laughs> <laughs> with, with bad scat lyrics. Oh Lyric, my God. Scat lyrics that you shouldn't ever, should, you know, the scat like, bop, da, ba, da, skip, skip, da, bop. but like, those are okay scat lyrics. I'm talking bad scat lyrics, like, <laughs> flies or flies or squeak, squeedo, squeedo. You're like, that's not a good scat lyric. <laughs> so, you know, so I would come in, you know, and surprise them because I'd have a, a, an audition on the Paramount lot and that I would wander up to the Star Trek offices and I'd be like, all right, Jimmy boy. <laughs> you know, like doing oh my that, God, that's the, amazing. the weird Irish music they did for Finnegan, who seemed like a real dick, that guy. <laughs> oh, Jimmy boy, you'll never be as fast as me, Jimmy. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. So great. Yeah. Um, you were in Enterprise too, weren't you? Were like a, Very briefly, like an episode? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was a situation where, where I just wanted to know what it was like to be on a Star I wanted to be on a Star Trek show and I wanted to know what it was like to be in that level of makeup. Yeah. And boy, I found out. <laughs> and a, like an 18 hour day uh, covered oh entirely. And I mean, I, I'll tell you, you know, 
I know Michael Dorn didn't necessarily have his hands covered up or this part of his face, yeah. but he was yeah. in it for years. Yeah. Or, or you know, Garrick or any of those, yeah. you know, Michael the um, uh, Armin Shimmerman actually, when we got him in the game, uh, he we had to make him new teeth because he couldn't teeth. do the voice without the teeth. Yeah, and he had right. lost his teeth, so we had to actually get someone in LA to recast his mouth and make a set of Ferengi teeth so he could wear them while he was recording. Because otherwise, I he couldn't absolutely do the voice. noticed that totally. Because <laughs> I was like, when I was listening, I'm like, that's they. He's doing it with the teeth. I yeah. thought maybe they saved him. Yeah, uh, I saved I think, my being I think, human teeth, so I thought maybe he had yeah. his. I think Aaron still had his in a jar, but uh, no, Armin Armin had lost his. You know, I'm so sad. I, I was going to um, meet Aaron on his uh, podcast. Uh, oh, right Seventh Rule. Before... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I was I was looking forward to that because I, you know, Nog had such an incredible arc, a uh, bigger, a uh, larger arc, I think, than maybe any character on Star Trek in terms of the travel yeah. of that arc. And so I was I was really excited to to gonna you know, I was going to be on his podcast and just talk about how much I loved all of their stuff and. And then he uh, he passed. I um, that was, yeah, that's too bad. Was, I'm was very rough. bad. I mean, awful. I, yeah. I you know the, the guy is a, uh, you know I I loved what he did with that character. Yeah, he I, was I absolutely was crazy we, about it. We got to hang out with him a lot at STLV and stuff, and he was an amazing, amazing person. And I, I'm just glad because Cap Captain Nog, you know Nog captaining his own starship that's that's the end of that character's journey and i'm glad right. it exists somewhere i it, for if nothing else i hope this game lasts a thousand years just to keep that going i know what you mean it's it's one of the most um satisfying things about this game is is the continuation of some of these yeah. characters arcs i mean to hear um renee uh Abijin, uh Abijin Moi, um as odo again yeah. i hope i said his name correctly I I, that's Abijin how i Moi. would say it so yeah um and uh, you know, to hear that voice again, yeah, it's such an iconic voice. Yeah. So you know, and I and I've you know I've see that little memorial up on the yeah. second story of the uh, Starfleet base. Yeah. Um, you know, so many. You know, I, I had a lovely conversation with um, Walter Koenig on a plane because we were coming from a from a convention, and he has taken the stance and I'm going to dispute it. He's taken the stance in recent years and he's done this publicly. If you can see this on YouTube, uh, William Shatner's raw nerve. He's taken the stance that because, because Shatner asked him, you know, it's like, what? So tell, now tell me what, what the trouble is, you know, with some of the cast and me and, and Kane, it goes, well, it's, it's two parts. One where I think we're right. And one where I think we're wrong. And the one where I think we're right is you, you said, look, you were like the director on set, man. Like you were the lead, but all the directors, they listened to you. You were, you were very forceful and you were constantly out there making changes, doing things saying, well, why don't we stage it like this? Or why do we have this line here? Let's get rid of this line or blah, 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 do this stuff. And it was always, you, you had extraordinary energy to make it as good a show as it could possibly be made. You were, you were ceaseless when it came to that. And having been in that position as Shatner, having led a show, yeah. I, I understand that very well. But Kenny goes, but the thing that maybe you didn't realize was that when you'd say, why is this line here? Because later in the scene, someone says the same thing. So, and Spock says it later. So why don't we just get rid of this line? He's like, that may have been right for the scene, but you have to remember that you just took away one of maybe three lines that that bit character mm -hmm. had. Maybe you know, Nichelle Nichols or myself or uh, George, uh, George Decay. Yeah. So, and you hear that said, happening enough that adds up whether it's right. whether he said, his attentions or not. He said, we were, we were all actors. We were all trying to, you know, to make our way and, you know, and, and we were all trying to make an impression. This is the job. This is the wave that we got and we're trying to make the most of it. And so to have a big chunk of our work cut out because you didn't think that line needed to be there that would it was those type of things where you were just not aware and shatner was like oh my you could see shatner going oh he's like i can see that i can definitely see me myself back then i i i hoped that i'd be smarter than that but i can see it you know and like but then the part where where Kona goes now here's the part where we were wrong he said star trek 
is a wonderful ensemble show with a great crew, except it's not. It was never an ensemble show. It was about three guys. It was about Kirk, Spock, and, Bo and yeah. Bones. And, and if you look at the beginning credits, and it's there it is. There's the three guys. And you guys were there all the time. You were there every day with scenes after scene after scene. We were only there sometimes once a week. Yeah. So we understand that you maybe didn't get to know us very well. We understood it better then. But then as Star Trek, after it got canceled and it became this, it had this rise to prominence and in the reruns became famous and these characters became famous and the characters became legendary. He said, he said, we started thinking our, of our, as ourselves as the stars of the show as well, because people were treating us that way. Finally, they're going, it's, it's Chekhov, you know, and it's all these things. And so it made us reflect back, well, then why didn't Shatner treat us like that? It's, it was an ensemble show. And he's like, well, the truth is it wasn't. And we were out there at these new, thi new things called Star Trek conventions. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and this is a quote from, from Koenig. He's like, we were taking credit for work that largely we didn't do, that you guys did that work and, and, and you guys created that show. And we were along for the ride and I think we contributed, but we started really maybe overestimating our contribution. So that's the stance he's taken. And I saw him at a convention and he was on the, and then on the plane back, ride back, he was behind me. And I turned around and I, I, as people were loading on the plane and I, I sat up and I peeked over the chair. I'm like, hi, Walter Koenig, I'm Sam Whitwer. How are you doing? Listen, <laughs> I'm like, you're, you were so charismatic in that role and, and, and wonderful work in Star Trek. And he goes, oh, I, I really didn't do that much. And I could tell that he was still, again, on that whole yeah. tip of, you know, we were taking credit for work that wasn't ours. Now, here's my argument. Yes and no. Yes, in that you guys weren't there that much. Right. No, in that no one would have cared who Chekhov was if he wasn't damned charismatic every time he was on the screen. Hell yeah. Sulu. No one would care. Uhura. She pops. These characters, they just, they just pop on the yeah. screen. That even if they had one or two lines, you were like, I mean, George Takei with that incredible voice, you know, raising shields, Captain. You know, like just. In, but but he had this 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 presence and this voice, and Nichelle Nichols, this poise and this charisma, and and Chekhov had this playfulness and this fun to him, and 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 with and and I've you know as much as I've done Shatner's job, been the <laughs> as a, yeah. there's a salad on your look out, it's a pet salad. Um, <laughs> so, but you know, I've done Shatner's job, but I've also done. Walter Koenig's job that in Battlestar Galactica I had a tiny itty bitty little role and let me tell you um, oftentimes it's a lot easier to make an impression or to do the right thing or to say the line the right way or this not when you have a lot more material when you have a little bit of material very hard to know what to do with it you and the one shot to those, hit right and that's, that's right it. so so while I think it's wonderful and humble that he feels that way my thing is brother no one would care if you guys weren't damn charismatic and really had some craft behind those moments you know yeah. that's my take on walter koenig i'm like you were you were fantastic come on nuclear wessels dude <laughs> apparently that was that was ad-libbed <laughs> that, that the woman who came up to him and he goes do you do you know where the nuclear wessels are she goes oh yeah i think it's across the bay in alameda that's what i said alameda but where is alameda you know and, there, and <laughs> that, that, that comedic timing between nichelle nichols and him and the woman in the street wasn't an actress. They apparently had to run after her and say, hi, listen, listen, you were just in a movie. Can we sign you to a contract? <laughs> we want to use that footage. Oh my apparently God. that's what happened. She was a civilian and these people were ad-libbing wow. in the street. And, and dude, ad-libbing, even when you're working with actors, is very difficult. Ad-libbing with real people and for Nichelle Nichols and, oh, yeah. and Walter Koenig to have that, that comedic timing, impossible, yeah. unless you're really talented. Yeah. You know? Anyway, it's really, really cool. I uh, that's actually one of the reasons why um, <coughs> four is one of my favorite movies, just because watch, you get movie. to watch so much of the rest of the cast just kind of yeah. get out and flex and enjoy themselves, and it's yeah. great. Oh, and dude, and speaking of four, um, so someone who will not be named, uh, who uh, is a really great guy and a very talented person who worked <laughs> on the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies, mm. um, one of the actors. I was having a conversation with him and he said, yeah, you know, I had a little uh, guilty pleasure last night. I'm like, well, what's that? And he's a total nerd. Yeah. I'm like, and, and, and he said, yeah, I, guilty pleasure. I'm like, what guilty pleasure? He's like, well, I watched Star Trek four. I'm like, what's, what's guilty pleasure about that? He goes, well, it's not. And he said, it's not really a Star Trek movie. And I'm like, whoa, 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 who
I'm like, what do you mean it's not a Star Trek movie? And they're like, well, it's, you know, and I'm like, before you even say anything, it's the most Star Trek movie. Yeah. If you don't, if that's not a Star Trek movie, then Trouble with Tribbles, a piece of the action, uh, City on the Edge of Forever are not Star Trek episodes. Yeah. I mean, dude, that movie is the, is, is the, uh, representative of all of those classic episodes where there was no bad guy. It was just a really interesting problem. And that the characters were dealing with them the best they could, you know, like love yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <Cheers again>. Puppers. <laughs> all right. Well, we've been going for a while, a little bit more than an hour now. And unfortunately I have to go soon to go pick up my daughter. Um, but <laughs> Sam, it has been awesome having you on the show. I'd love to have you back anytime you want just to geek out about Star Trek. Um, yeah. This has been great. Thank my you. Pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, and uh, folks, thank you guys so much for, for sitting with us. Um, we appreciate it. <laughs> Someone <laughs> in chat said, don't stop now. Your daughter can wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. And yeah. Uh, yeah, well, and dude, I, I also want to say thank you because one of the one of the pleasures of playing Star Trek Online is that it is so very clear to me that the people that are working on it uh, love the hell out of Star Trek. So it's so fun to explore the different corners of the Star Trek universe and see the extraordinary detail, and then also to be kind of a stickler for this stuff to feel like you didn't get it wrong. You know what I mean? To like yeah. find these details and go, wow, they. They thought I about see why that. they did it that way. That's what an ex what an obscure detail to get right. And I keep finding myself saying that over and over and over again. That that the details that go into these stories or these planets or stuff like that yeah. um, are are so meticulously crafted. And I, I really get a kick out of that. That and also the uh, modifying the spaceships. I, I'm a sucker for that yeah. kind of thing. You got to 3D so. print yourself some, man. Clear off some room on that shelf. Get yourself some, uh, <laughs> Indeed. some 3D Absolutely. printed ships. Uh, yeah, I, it's one of the things I love about uh, working here. Um, the team, you could tell, because a lot of these guys that I work with have been on here for, you know, six, seven years or even the whole time. And they, you know, were carrying the Star Trek torch for so long when there wasn't yeah. anything new on TV. It's, it's, it's a huge amount of responsibility that they're... Uh, yeah. they they were uh, taking on and happy to do so. Yeah, it's great. well, it's 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 really fun. I again, I I love going into these stories and finding. I mean, first of all, I love the fact that Tony Todd got his identity back. Oh god, because yeah. that was something that I know he was upset with in Deep Space Nine that they did that to him. So I'm glad that you guys gave it back to him. Yeah. You know. <laughs> that was something you know, Al as soon as more. we as soon as we found out we were getting Tony Todd uh, Al Rivera our lead designer that was the first thing he said is like cool so we're putting Kern back <laughs> well and, and but, but I love that you you deal with him for a long time as his alternate identity because yeah. you're like yeah that guy would still rise through the ranks he would still do stuff yeah. but it was um you know so many really lovely things and also dude here's something and I and, I, and I'm gonna put this out there you know I talk about how I like the John Ford Klingons yeah and certain concepts that have that have changed a little bit over the years. One of the things that has changed in Star Trek that I get a kick out of when it comes to, for example, the ground combat in Star Trek Online, um, the ground combat with personal shields and just it's chaotic yeah. and madness. Yeah. That is, I think, what a phaser battle or a disruptor battle would look like. You know, I, I thought Discovery did it very well when they were in the alternate universe and they had that big shootout and there yeah. were turrets that came out and all this crazy weird technology to where you almost didn't know what you were seeing because you're like, it wouldn't look like a like a gunfight that you just switch out, you know, revolvers <laughs> for phasers. It wouldn't look like that. It would be something totally different. And even in in the original series, there were no real proper if I can remember, there were no real proper phaser gunfights. They were yeah. they they were always talking that like this hand phaser melted down 300 of those troops over there. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Just over there. Like, didn't you see it? <laughs> you, you left this, you left this phaser on the planet. You left the people use the phaser and they've killed 300 troops. You're responsible. You know, like they, they always talked about these weapons so that they were extraordinarily powerful. So then, but then by the time that you get to next gen, they're having phaser shootouts and you're like, I don't think these things would miss. Yeah. I think you would just put it on wide beam and just like, <laughs> you know disintegrate everything in front of you and i get it it's like you know that the reason they probably didn't have gunfights in the original series was probably budgetary and special effects and all yeah. that stuff but so i appreciated that there were like personal shields and stuff that would make it so that you could have a gunfight realistically without 
you know. Yeah, exactly, because you get melted <laughs> down in one shot otherwise. You melted down. Yeah, yeah exactly. Wide yeah. beam, you're done. Because they do that a lot in the original series. They're like, a bunch of people are running toward Kirk and Spock, and he's like, wide angle, fa- you know, stun, fire. And <laughs> they all fall over, you know, like <laughs> one shot. Yeah. So anyway, I, I appreciate certain details that you guys are taking liberties and with because I'm like, that makes more sense. And of course, you're also, you know, gods in ground combat who can summon fire from the skies and That's lava right. from below. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Right. Right. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, Sam, it has been an absolute pleasure. And uh, thank you very much for stopping by. And uh, awesome. thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, we'll talk to you again next week. Bye bye, everyone.